it doesn't really matter. The principles will cross over. They'll transcend those different formats as we move forward. I'm going to have a good time with you here. I just want to give you a heads up. We do have thunderstorms about to hit here in the Washington, D.C. area where I'm located. So I apologize for that, but you'll probably see different uh, shades of lighting go across me and my office here. But uh, I've got a hot spot on my phone, so I think we'll be able to persevere as we go through it. About halfway through, we'll take a five-minute bio break. So if you want to stretch, if you need to go to the bathroom, that's fine. Uh, if you want to set up a spin class or hot yoga to one side, that's fine too. You want to exercise. But I will stay here, and I'll just answer questions. We have a small enough group tonight uh, that we can actually have you just undo the mute and talk openly. Please, I invite you to do that, or the chat box. And Susan will let me know if I'm in flow and I'm not saying one of the questions. And then also realize that after this session, if you see the recording months and years down the road, I will still be up for conversation. So if you'd like to say, well, I was thinking about this, or yeah, but what would you say to? I'm up for that. Really, truly, we can talk about that anytime. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm assuming all of you have downloaded the handout. You don't have to write anything uh, that's literally verbatim on the screen because that's already provided to you. But it was sent to you in the email earlier. If you don't know where it is, you can contact Susan afterwards. But um, if you have things you know, triggered in your mind, yeah, let's talk about that. Our general itinerary will be these six things. So we'll talk about definition and how assessment's all about advancing student learning, and then the tools you might need, and then the different types that are out there that are particularly useful to teachers. The principles, there's 14 of them, but we will have already talked about a huge swath of them, so it's only a few left over in that segment. And then becoming evidentiary. I'm gonna talk a lot more about that in the December 3rd descriptive feedback session. However, right here, some exciting news and a couple of mindsets. And then we'll talk about, hey, what, what, what of this transfers to the remote or online learning situation? Now, as we're going forward, I just want to remind you to take a deeper dive. This is a total waste of time for you to sit here and listen to this or exercise and listen to this, or maybe you're on walk right now at the end of your workday, whatever it is to listen to this, unless you process. So I'd like to suggest four things that will help, really help carry you forward. One is, hey, what has been revalidated? I knew it kind of walking into this experience and just keep a running list of this. Yeah, I knew that. Yeah, I knew that. But then what are some new things? I'm interested in exploring just a little bit more and maybe you need some references for that and I'd be glad to help by email or something. And then I'm curious. I wonder about really just kind of expand big wish list, divergent thinking. Don't be afraid to ask any question. And then one of the best things you can do is really kind of process a shift, nuanced or very profound. I used to think this, but now ah, I think this. And that's really where a lot of professional development happens. The rubber hits the road, so to speak. It becomes quite real. So I'm gonna suggest you kind of grab onto that as best you can as you're introducing yourselves. I see on the chat room, that's awesome. So here's my suggestion, let's begin. So first, a few slides from, there will be a few slides from the earlier spring session, some of you may have seen that we repeat here because I would be remiss if I did not recognize it as one of those foundations for assessment. And that's the title of or about the whole focus. So this is, these two slides are, are some of those, but it does create a mindset. And I'm going to suggest to you again, you can do both of these things I'm about to share with you with these slides individually really well but you can't do them simultaneously because one corrupts the capacity of the other. So I'm gonna ask you to take a philosophical stance. Do you think assessment and grading and the entire enterprise of that is to merely sort children to see who has stars upon bars, you sneeches, as we said back in the spring? That's what this slide is. And it turns out that weak, ineffective teachers exacerbate that the most. Take a read and decide whether or not you'd like your own child to be in this class. Probably not, but wait a minute. Do you think assessment is not for sorting, but assessment and grading is for 
cultivating and developing students and their talents. Notice how I put a full color, really cute slide picture there just to persuade you that you should prefer this. I'm trying to manipulate you. So take a look at this and decide, would you like your child in this class? I hope you would say yes. I'll give you a moment to read it now. So there you go. It's a little bit like Jay McTighe and Grant Wiggins backwards lesson design. Backward lesson design, you know, where you design whatever the ultimate learning target is, the outcome, whatever it is, and you find the multiple pathways to get everybody there. And I'm an adult, I'm a professional, I can do more than one trick, and I have a wide repertoire of strategies. So I've got the versatility to make sure everyone is successful. So the mindset is not here's the curriculum, now let me document how you sink or swim. That's not even close to the role of assessment. And really our role as teachers, our role is let me teach in whatever way you best learn to maximize your learning over that which otherwise could be achieved with a one size fits all canned program. It's the pragmatist credo, again, whatever works. So let's really consider this for a moment. In the very base definition, assessment comes from a sitere to sit beside. So it's a coaching tool. Wow. It's whatever you do to gather data so you can inform your instructional design, figure out the next steps, help the child develop feedback. That's great. So now superimposing on top of that, what this really is, is about creating the capacity for forward movement, as you see highlighted in the light blue. It's operable information. We're trying to assess in such a way as to be helpful. Oh, well, a lot of you are probably familiar with this one, assessment of, which is just mere documentation, as opposed to what we're about, hey, assessment for learning. So let's advocate for that. We're doing this to enhance the learning, not just to play gotcha. I've documented all your deficiencies. Come back tomorrow for more of the same rejection. It'll be fun. That's not what we're about. So are we really going to advance student learning? What would that possibly mean? Well, it could mean that the primary function is instruction, not documentation. In fact, I don't know if you're aware of this, but every single time you ask kids to retrieve knowledge for a test. So I'm now gonna do a quiz, a test, a quick write, a paper, a project. Every time you ask kids to take that knowledge access it, and then re-deliver it via format, it's an overt act of direct instruction. You're actually speeding up learning. It's a relearning experience. So if you were doing lesson plans, you could list like, here's my goal, here are my materials, here are my assessments, here are my learning sequence activities. You could put the assessments in the learning activities and be legit. In the world of cognitive science, we realize that actually taking or doing assessments is a form of learning the material. But as this teacher recognizes, it's also to help kids develop a self-efficacy. I own my learning. I will not yield to learned helplessness. I will not yield to the need for external validation. So they actually mature a lot better and they develop agency, a voice, choice, that efficacy, executive function in their own learning. So we're really mindful of these larger umbrella themes operating through what we do. That means that we have to get across to students that you are not your grade. A grade is not a statement of character or the student in any degree. It is merely a summative judgment of the evidence you present of that particular learner outcome as of one arbitrary calendar date imposed on the next generation on a uniform timeline. How's that for a, just a big mouthful of words? But that's indeed what it is. It's very arbitrary and it's just one moment in time. Well, wait a minute, what does that mean? It means that grades, which we're really not talking about very much in this session, but really what we're talking about has impact on that, but grades are a temporary locator along a particular line at any one give it, given moment of time. So if I'm given through assessment, new evidence, higher or lower or different, whatever it is, I can change my position. So a grade is not something safely in the bank. What we say is that was the evidence presented as of that date. But now here's the evidence presented of the, this date. And then we draw from that a summative judgment of some sort at the end 
which is not really that helpful. We try to keep it disaggregated, but sometimes we're required to do that and that's fine, but know that it's made up and it's far more helpful to look at evidence that can be overturned or changed as assessment can change. Huh, so where's assessment dynamic? It's the tool we use to decide where you are and where to go next. So it's almost like the belay lines, uh, the compass, all the tools you need for the student here to climb the mountain or the rock. Yeah, we can do that. Now, descriptive feedback plays a huge role in this. I mean, to have assessment without having descriptive feedback to make it actionable, what a waste. Oh my gosh, why would you do this? But we wanna give you those techniques in December. That'll be the closing frame. This is the opening frame. So we're gonna talk only about assessment here and not about descriptive feedback techniques. You do have some examples of that in that previous spring webinar. If you'd like to go to the ERLC website and take a look at that. I just want you to know that's coming up on December 3rd. So mark your calendars. We'll spend a really good deeper dive there as well. So now let's get into the assessment stuff. In this first section, a reminder that if you're going to assess, you have to know your students. So some really quick, very helpful ideas on getting to know your students. And that's gonna be particularly powerful this year out of almost all the other years in the past few decades is building that relationship, knowing the kids so you can really make some connections in your class. So what's the very first tool I'm gonna to suggest to you? It's your listening ear, seriously. Just be quiet around the kids and listen and find ways to give them instruments so they do feel comfortable sharing and listen deeply. Listening is not just being quiet, it is literally taking notes as you can and then investing in who they are, seeing them as infinitely valuable, worthy of your great endeavor with them. And that's just, you know, you wanna draw upon some of their strengths and go, I wonder how I can make this connective and meaningful to them rather than here's the stuff. Let me just sink, watch you sink or swim with it. So we're going to listen first and foremost and the majority of the time. But then some really cool ways to do this. Hand out cards if they're back in the classroom or you can do this digitally online. Just say, what's the best way for you to learn reading, writing, learn science, uh, learn mathematics? And kids are very candid. They really will be very honest with you. Uh, they'll say, you know, always show a visual something if you want me to remember it, because I don't remember it if you just say it. That's very helpful. I've had some kids write down, hey, talk much slower. When teachers talk fast, I miss most of it. Ah, very helpful. I often have my, my notebooks organized by different subjects. Could I do that with you? I mean, they have all kinds of ideas, but this is a rubber band stack of index cards that I use when I'm in the classroom that are referenced frequently. And then I love this one. I stopped sending home interest surveys. I just, it just, I wasn't getting enough back. Tell me about your child. Give me three words to describe it. Have you traveled anywhere? What are the language spoken at home? That sort of thing. What hobbies does he or she do they have? What I said instead was in a million words or less, tell me about your child. It's so cathartic. I learned about it at Middle Web, at, at actually a subset of that called Middle Talk. And it was decades ago and I used it, oh boy. Our parents are so forthcoming when they can just write freely about their child. I get a higher return rate when I do that one. But now look at the third one. The students are allowed to take on the moniker right through the pseudonym of their parents. So you are to pretend to be your parents describing you, their child, to me, the teacher. It's the one time in the entire school year they're allowed to call me by my first name. And they think they're so full of themselves. They're like, so dear Rick. <laughs> well, you know, Jason has Hebrew school or whatever it might be. So understand on Saturday, it's really hard. Yeah, whatever it is, I usually have to caution kids because when you write under a pseudonym, you tend to be a bit more free and candid. And I'm like, oh, please be sure you only share things your parents would be comfortable with you sharing. But I find out so much more about the kids when they pretend to be their parents describing their child to me. And then if you feel comfortable and it's reasonable in your community, so many kids have a social media footprint and you can ask to see some of their things. Just remember that what goes on there is usually curated. They only put forth what they want the world to see and what, how they like the world to see them. And that should probably be a prism or a lens through which you see the material that's there. But some have great TikToks or YouTube channels or Instagram accounts. 
I would say Facebook, but that's pretty gone now for the younger generation. Now, one of the coolest things you can do to get to know a kid is do something collaborative. These are ones that I do every single year when I'm in the classroom. What? Yeah, we write an article together and the students are quoted. Maybe some of their parents are quoted, but they're contributing to the larger profession of education. It's awesome. We do service projects. We'll leave at 7 a.m. and come back at 7 p.m. and hike a mountain. I know I happen to have a, a good authority because I've been there. You have a really particularly mountainous region. I know you have flat areas too, but if you can get to a mountain, you can try that or just go for a beautiful hike along one of the, the, the wonderful rivers in your area. And then participate in outdoor education as much as you can, a compass course of some sort, whatever it might be, collaboration is where you kind of pull away some of the things that would keep you distant from each other. And I would recommend it as one of the greatest sources of getting to know a kid. And then, you know, do whatever you can do for physical distancing, of course. But there's so much you can collaborate on without actually physically being in the room. These are also wonderful tools that people use from time to time. Lexile is just the readability level, kind of see where the reading levels are. A leaning Tower of Pisa, I love that. You lean left if you believe this, lean right if you believe that, stay in the middle if you really don't know and you want me to call on you. This kind of forces kids, oh, I'll just lean because I don't want to be called on. But it's just one of those ways of dip sticking, which is a term from John Saffier's The Skillful Teacher book. Highly recommend that book, The Skillful Teacher, John Saffier. And he talks about the tools of te that teachers use that are successful. And one is like, you put the dipstick in and check the level of the oil. So I'm gonna sample where you are. Wipe boards, if you're physically in the class, if they write it and put it above their heads, online polls, audience systems, uh, any kind of technology you can use, of course. And then one of my favorite things to do, I'll recommend to you, is a science autobiography, reading autobiography. Tell me the story of how you did all that. As we mentioned before, you can do it in a variety of things as a gamer, uh, world language, religious beliefs, whatever it is that you feel comfortable that you're teaching. And then six word memoirs. I love six word memoirs. Many of you know the story of for sale, baby shoes, never worn. Hemingway was asked, write the greatest, write, write the shortest possible story that is the greatest emotional wallop. And that one really is kind of a kicker right here, but you can do funny ones and romantic ones. You see a lot of them listed there. But one of the things you can do with kids is have them do that. A six word memoir, not five, not seven. And they're usually with six words, every word counts. They're usually very profound. And what they do is like, here's my six word memoir as a student last year, as a reader, as a gamer, as a writer, as a musician, as a member of this country. Here's what I was feeling. Then you can actually do that with content. A six word memoir of a water molecule going through the water system or six word memoir of a comma, six word memoir of a historical figure or a book's character. Yeah, you can do those things, so it helps. And then this is just a, a, a preview of the descriptive feedback. Have the kids, once they do a quiz, a project of some sort, they do a little analysis and you can write at the top of the columns anything you want them to analyze. In this particular case, I had some students who didn't understand if they were careless or clueless when it came to understanding the math you see there. So they fill it out. And again, we'll talk more about this in December, but then they write a letter of analysis and action. I seem to understand. I need assistance or help in. Oh, here's what I like to suggest I do to learn it. They're owning their learning, but it's a way to get to know the kids when they do their own critical error analysis. It really, really helps. And then of course, as they do reading notations, and you can set up whatever you want them to highlight and find a salient. Here's some suggestions that I use in my class. They can do annotations as well. So you see how they're interacting with text. Really, really good stuff. And then very quickly, I want them to self-monitor, but they share that self-monitoring with me. Wow, do I get information with Likert scales? or video footage and they analyze it maybe through Flipgrid or other software that allows you to do that. And then they're trying to decide like Chris Devani is asking us, hey, how do I know when I do know and how do I know when I don't know? And they're really kind of exploring those ideas. These are wonderful learning logs or some kind of journal dedicated to the subject where they're really exploring the ideas, just some prompts, some opening stems. If you wanna get some to kind of reinvigorate that in your particular practice, the last little so slide here in this segment is 
if you want to really be responsive to kids in front of you and use assessment to inform instructional design, you have to become a little mini expert in the different things that are represented in your class, including any COVID-19 challenges. So I need to get up to speed on gifted, advanced children, accelerated children. I need to get up to speed on children with learning disabilities. I need to get up to speed on, hey, if the kids really are into politics, I wonder if I could use that somehow, that passion for politics in my class. I need to understand transiency rates. And this family has been in five schools in four years. I need to understand what's going on in a family that does that and how might that affect learning? that sense of they really don't belong or they're still looking for their place or dealing with the, those uh, challenges in their family. This is just a, a beginning list of some of the things where you wanna do a deeper dive. So now imagine you get some students in your class that are going through trauma or they're really, really um, uh, involved in their heritage in First Nations, Indigenous peoples. And that's just really a, a vital source of oxygen really for their family great, I need to really get a deeper dive into that culture, that heritage, to understand that a lot more, to incorporate in the class, and to show respect that you and all that you are have a seat at learning's table. And I value what you bring to the learning equation. So I'm hoping that you've got at least something there you can riff off of, you can take and run with it, and, and add to your own repertoire of ideas. All of this stuff in this first segment was in an article that I put out, it got a good uh, round uh, of sharing about two years ago, and it's available to you for free at the website there, rickwarnley.com. How do we get to know our kids so we can actually respond to them? So if you wanna see any of these ideas fleshed out, grab the article or share it with other people who weren't able to enjoy us here. And if you're seeing this months and years down the road, I'll keep the article up and the website up for as long as I'm alive, it'll be up and going, so no worries. All right, now let's go to that next segment. We've got to identify the types of assessment, and now we might get into more controversial territory. So if you weren't perky at the end of your day, get perky now. Uh, we'll, we'll get into the more discussable things, and I'm hoping that you'll go, hey, who am I going to share this with, and what are we going to talk about? Remember, the brain is innately social, so you really got to keep things together, but then once you have this, really got to talk about it with others. I think that I am so better served in the classroom for having been mentored and to mentor others. Like when you have a student teacher, the student teacher asks these really candid questions and you have to explain why you do what you do. You are better as a teacher, more effective for having been forced to do a critical examination of pedagogy. So I'm gonna ask you to think about with whom you're gonna share these ideas and what are you gonna talk about? Maybe you wanna identify those people as we're moving through it. Let's take a look at what we're really talking about, pre-assessments, formative, summative, valid, common assessments, alternative, and reassessments. We'll really define and talk about what they might mean real quickly, each one of them, to make sure we're up to speed. So pre-assessments. Understand there's three real goals here with pre-assessment, only one of which is what the teacher gets out of it. So if you ask any teacher, hey, why should you pre-assess? That one you see there will be the rationale that comes up. Uh, to find out about the kids. Yeah, that's so I know what to do. Now, a lot of us are like, you know, I've been teaching grade 10s, grade threes, you know, for a long time. Uh, yeah, 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 I know exactly what to do. I don't need to do a pre-assessment. Well, my response to you is, you might be surprised occasionally, but the pre-assessment is not about you. It's really about what the students gain from doing the pre-assessment. What do you mean? Well, let's take it, look at two thirds, the majority of the reason why I would do a pre-assessment. The first one is the sense of growth over time. I need to get a baseline of where you are right now. And I know a whole bunch of our kids might write in response to a pre-assessment, IDK, 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 you know, for I don't know and text messaging, IDK, IDK, oh, they answer this one. But they need to have that baseline. And then during the unit, we help them monitor how they're progressing from here to here. What decisions did you make that led to this level of success? or in some cases, lack thereof. But they go through it, go through it. We finally take the big old test at the end, but we pull out the baseline. Whoa, you went from here to here? Well, nothing motivates like a sense of making progress. That's a wonderful gift that a principal gives a teacher and teachers give students. So please, I implore you, set it up so progress can be visible, can be perceived 
by the students and then literally take the time to point this out. Now, when they go to the next one in the next unit and they're doing a pre-assessment, ah, uh, I don't know any of this stuff. This is gonna be a steep mountain to climb. Wait a minute, I have every visual that I went from zero to hero in a Disney way, that I went from knowing nothing to being very competent. I can do it. And that actually releases dopamine. Goal setting and the perception of progress releases dopamine, the sense of moderate euphoria, well-being, and the students invest more in their learning. They do. Now, the last one there, when I do a pre-assessment, I'm priming the brain for what to elevate to, to really salient uh, status so they know what's important in the chapter, in the video, in the, the lecture I might do, or whatever learning experience it might be. Without that priming, they don't retain the material as long. So I do a pre-assessment, the kids wrestle with it, they hem and haw, ah, but now a few days later, we're in the middle of the unit and every time the kids will do this, some of the kids will do this. Ah, that was one of the topics on the pre-assessment. Everybody write that down, that's like really important because the pre-assessment is really a solid reflection or a, a, a replicate of what's gonna be happening ultimately in the summative assessment. So for those two powerful reasons, please do pre-assessments, don't just leave it to, I've been teaching long enough. I know, I think I know where most kids are. It's not about you. It's about what the students get out of the experience. And then what about the role of formative and summative? Notice we're calling it summative judgment. This is the final declaration of all you are. There is no more. We talked a little bit about this in the spring webinar. Formative assessment is aptly named, but summative assessment, nah, not a good name because assessment, assidere, coaching, implies feedback and critique are gonna be given, and I'm be, gonna be allowed to revise in light of that and be assessed anew. So let's just call it what it really is so we're mindful of the role, summative judgment, there is no more, or get radical. And what do I mean by that? It means that anything originally declared to the community, to the class, as summative judgment can be totally turned into a formative assessment anytime you darn well want. The only reason a final exam final paper, final project can't be redone is because somebody sets that policy, not because it was instructionally sound or pedagogically reasonable to do that. Well, wow. So just think about that for a minute. Anything in the coming to know part, that formative part is now considered just a status check and we'll get this really helpful feedback in the assessment and then I can use that and grow from it hot dog that is so cool so now we're thinking about oh my gosh i need to develop all these formative assessments that are so actionable and so what does a formative assessment look like i have had people ask me hey rick could i see one of your formatives and one of your summatives so i can see the difference and what do i do i hand them the exact same thing you can use a total final exam final project as a formative assessment I will tell you that formative assessments usually involve less curriculum. They're a little bit more laser focused. But the format, the medium used to convey evidence isn't formative or summative in its nature, in its structure. What makes any assessment formative and summative is when you use it during the learning journey and then how you use the data from it instructionally. That's it. So you can't look at an assessment and go, that's a really good formative assessment. That's a really good summative assessment. Buffalo bagels, that's my polite Virginia term. That's a mistake. So what we're really thinking about is, is this assessment diagnostic? Or is it supposed to be final evaluative judgment? There is no more. Well, think about this. On a final summative exam where there's no chance to go any further and turn it into formative, it's pretty much an exercise in frustration of what might have been if I give you lots of descriptive feedback, but you're not allowed to make it actionable. What a global waste of time and it just breeds resentment. So we're not gonna do that. So a quiz, okay, the child takes a quiz. He does terrible on it. Oh my goodness, it, it creates fear in him. Like, I don't know this and I got an F or a zero, or whatever your scale might be. So he turns and says to ask the teacher, are these same questions gonna be on the test in, in two weeks, the final exam? Yes, they will, Junior, you say. All right, so he studies. Now you trust your test to be valid. We'll talk about that coming up. So it's an accurate reporting instrument of what you claim it's reporting. And those questions are on the test. And he does learn it in the interim. And he does demonstrate full evidence of proficiency with it. 
he's rock solid. That means the earlier quiz is irrelevant. If you ask any assessment grading expert in the world, they will talk about the most recent evidence is the most accurate evidence. Oh, so that's the greatest indicator. So when it comes to instruction, we need to remember this needs to be a safe place because it's merely diagnostic. Assessment is just data. It's just information we're going to use. It is not a label of you, and it's not permanent in the bank. Remember, it's ceaselessly in composition or temporary. You can shift, and it's really important for grading too. I cannot use your earlier first stumbling down blind alleys, your incomplete kind of answer as a record of your final proficiency, because that would be knowingly distorting the grade. All right, so what about any of those activities like homework, classwork, how about labs in science or anything hands-on, lab-like in a math program or a coding class or what a music class, whatever, it is, something lab-like, well, you can't universally say all labs will count this amount because once again, you're going back to formative versus summative. Ah, is this lab we're doing where they're coming to know the new math idea or science idea? Okay, it counts zero. It's going to get a ton of feedback and you'll be allowed to revise in light of that, but it's a safe place to wrestle. You don't have to worry about it's going to be held against you as some final label of judgment of, of your proficiency. Or is this lab the culminating application of all we've learned? Now that can count for a grade because this is that point of, of final judgment. And remember what a grade is. It is just a summative judgment as of one arbitrary calendar date. So when, you, when you're mindful of this, you realize anything we do in route to that final proficiency is called formative. In fact, many assessment grading experts just say this, everything is formative. Everything, everything's formative until such time as you think they've declared, they've achieved proficiency, and then you say, okay, now it's summative. So you keep doing this until they actually learn it and learn it quite well. We assess against learner outcomes, the standards, uh, the, the learning targets, not the teacher methods we use to get there, the learner methods. So doing homework is irrelevant. Classwork, yeah, you might report completion rates, but that's a separate column on the report card. When you're about assessment, it's a safe place to do this in route to success. So I put that on a slide. It means that anything that is coming to know should be low stakes, which means no judgment or evaluation. It remains diagnostic, like we outlined a few slides ago. If it's the final culminating application, that becomes evaluative, final judgment. But we want it to maintain a safe place. Anybody have a yeah, but, or a concern about that you'd like to just kind of throw in there as we go through this? Never judge the first pancake. Susan, that's awesome. You're exactly right. All right. It's kind of like this. I would really, really like the person who designs my website to be one who's designed like 70 websites and dealt with all the ins and outs that come with that, the, the new insights. Oh, don't use that tool. Use that tool. And I've gotten feedback from their customers, not the one who's just sort of beginning to do it and they've only done it once and say, okay, now you've got it. No, that's where you cut your teeth. Now let's get better and better at it. So that reiteration is going to come to play again. So now, just a reminder, as you do formative versus summative, homework counts zero. What if the kid did no homework, no classwork, passive aggressive, insubordinate, defiant? He just doesn't do it. But on all the tests, because you trust the accuracy of the report because they're valid, you've got all the evidence the world is proficient. What you were assigning for homework was busy work. It didn't advance the kid at all. But if you lower his grade, you're knowingly falsifying the report of final proficiency, which is an ethical breach. It's a form of lying. And none of us have any moral authority to lie to children or their parents. Or reverse it. The child does a beautiful job in the homework, the bottom bullet, but bombs every test. The ultimate point is the grade is what you know at journey's end, not how you got there. So homework gets its own reporting. And it means that we separate real estate in our grade book. And we tell parents about it. This is formative. That also means that if you have software that does a running average, everything that gets entered is automatically tallied in an average, yet this is supposed to be formative coming to know stuff, you're doing it wrong. And I am begging you as a representative of all assessment grading folks in the world and people who are just caught up in modern pedagogy, try to step away from that as best you can. This idea of formative, formative, formative is going to count in the final average. 
Only the summit of material can do that. And we can give you suggestions how to designate that down the road if you like. Now, Rick, we have a question from sure. Joe. How do you help the kid who doesn't want to experiment or learn unless uh, it's for marks? I love that question. Exactly. And we're not doing the one on motivation. Oh, we can do one on motivation sometime in the spring if you like. But if you take a look at why kids would invest in their learning, you will see there's so many other practical tips in the world, like, for example, of executive function and some other ideas on how to get kids to do homework or classwork, even though there are no marks going to be on it. Now, one of the things that we realized very quickly, and we'll talk more about it in December, is that descriptive feedback is often the more motivating thing, not the mark. So what you can do is this. You can mark homework. You absolutely can do that if you need to, but it's reported in a separate column. So what I'm suggesting, what most assessment experts would suggest, is that you do a completion. You did, there were 35 homework assignments, and you did 32. So your percentage is this. If I need to assign a grade to that, fine. But I don't want to ruin homework, classwork, as a safe place to wrestle and extend yourself without fear that it's going to be held against you as final judgment, because kids won't stretch and push. So now, if we make homework interesting, and I think there's a responsibility on our part to do that, does it reflect your culture? Is it transformative? Is it meaningful to you? We find that people improve in a lot of the homework they do, the topics, when they find it very engaging and valuable to them. But if they're doing drudgery, they don't actually have any change, subsequent uh, or significant change in their performance of it. And then also, if you look at the statistical correlation between doing homework and subsequent academic achievement in high school or upper schools, if you're a private school, it's stunningly tiny. It's really shocking. A lot of people are shocked by that. And for middle school and lower, it's, it's even smaller. About grade three and lower, it actually has no academic impact whatsoever. You just have the students get used to the idea they'll do school-like things on the kitchen table in their homes after school is done each day. Uh, now today it's almost 24 seven if we're doing online instruction from home, but you get the idea. So I can't put all my eggs in that basket. So when people find and, and they take a course in motivation, how do you build self-discipline, respect for deadlines, uh, moral fiber, respect for the adults who care of you, you will find in the research, none of it says, yeah, use low marks when they fail to do it because that'll light a fire under their rear end. It actually doesn't work. It pushes them away from investing in the class. We have lots and lots of research on that. And I'd be glad to send you like a sequence of slides that I use in other seminars on, hey, what's some of that research? Let's get into that a little bit more if you'd like. So thanks, Joe. Please feel free to email me at the end. So now um, the other types we want to be mindful of here, of which we want to be mindful, speaking with good or English, as they say, is validity and reliability. Validity, as you see there in the definition, it measures what we say it measures. So this is an accurate report of your proficiency. That's validity. We love it as we do that. So um, Moss and Brookhart have a wonderful book, and I've listed it there at the bottom of the screen. But it's a really interesting uh, trick. A lot of people, when you look at their rubrics or their evidence proficiency, it's about doing stuff. You had this, you had that. That's not actually what you should be assessing. You want to see if they comprehend the plot. Well, what if they didn't have that, but they had this other stuff that was just as good a vehicle to represent the understanding of the plot? Wow. So what was the tagline from Jerry Maguire, the movie? Show me the money. What are we? show me the evidence of this stuff and whatever route it takes. And I love this phrase also from the Moss and Brookhart book, which I highly recommend. Do you have this about two criteria? See it there at the bottom, but they're just directions masquerading as characteristics of quality. So take that to heart, look at your rubrics or your about two criteria as to whether or not they understand uh, me medieval architecture versus Renaissance architecture or whatever you're teaching at the time and say, oh, were these just directions masquerading as a evaluative criteria for the particular learner outcome? Ah, uh, I could do so much better. So one of the cool things that you can do is ask for collegial review. So you might design a quiz, design a test or some kind of assessment prompt for a project and just hand it to somebody and say, so is this a good assessment? Is this a good test? And that person should grab it and put it to one side without even looking at it. And she say, tell me about what you think you're trying to assess. What evidence are you trying to elicit from students via this vehicle? That's what you're doing. 
And then they talk, you go back and forth, and then you pull that assessment back, and then you look at all the prompts and see how they correlate exactly with that standard learner outcome, or they don't correlate. And then that question is taken off the test. And then here's a good part, return the favor. Because when you analyze other people's assessments in light of this, you grow as well. It's like amazing is how that works. In fact, analyzing others can actually help you see more clearly in what you do as you move forward. So here's an example. Which one of these is the best assessment? I'll let your eye bounce through them. And you can post in the chat box. As soon as you have a response, just let me know which one is the best assessment, which number. Oh, something just happened. And it's not in the chat box. I'm seeing crickets or hearing crickets. Wait a minute. That means you're silent. And either you stepped away or you're actually thinking and reading through the stuff. But I just told you that's an impossible question. You can't decide. They're all awful or they're all wonderful based on what I'm actually trying to assess. So you should have pushed back and said, Rick, no way. This is impossible. Trick question. So there you go, Jennifer Webb. She posts, what goal and evidence do you want? Spot on. So now let me tell you the evidence and then you tell me which one. I want to, silence was the response, right? So now here we go. Ready? I want to know if you can really understand and appreciate the importance of latitude, longitude. Now which number or numbers seems to be the best? Any takers? Five is really creative. I mean, it represents the importance of it. That's a clue. It actually says the word important. So I, yeah, I would say five, spot on, Mandy. But I think number three would help because when they have to reveal the function and role of something, it talks about its importance. Let's try a different one. I wanna know if you can think divergently, creatively, about latitude and longitude. Which one? Or ones? Definitely number four. Thank you, John and Teresa. Absolutely. And maybe a little bit of five. Now I want to know if you can be practical. If I gave you latitude, co longitude coordinates, could you find it in, on a map someplace? Probably number two or something like that. Or if I gave you a place, could you tell me latitude, longitude? So everything correlates, assessment, your learner outcomes, evidence, and learner outcomes, evidence, back to assessment. It really tightens your assessments. It makes them shorter and cogent and really helpful for informing instructional design. So I hope that you would grab onto that and, and avail yourself of that. Reliability, that's the extent, as you see, to which it's very consistent and reliable and accurately measuring the learning, teacher to teacher, situation to situation. The problem is it's very hard to impose reliability protocols when you're a classroom teacher. That's usually a larger scale thing to be able to do. And that's what's described here in this wonderful website I recommend there in New Zealand. They really do a good job explaining that validity, reliability, and getting people up to speed and what's useful and providing some of the tools we can use. So here's my suggestion. I suggest that you strive for validity and you don't sweat the reliability. Of course, you might wanna try reliability as best you can, but really just say, is this an accurate representation instrument? Now, if this instrument prevents a child from accurately portraying what he or she or they know, ah, then I have to change the instrument. So if language gets in the way, culture gets in the way, a learning disability gets in the way, just something gets in the way. They don't have the experience to, to connect with the, the particular scenario, something like that. I have an obligation, a moral duty as a conscientious educator to change that instrument. Not if I'm creative or if I have time or if I'm in the mood, I have to change it because I can't knowingly falsify a grade and the assessment I would draw from it would be bad assessment. It couldn't inform my instructional decisions and it couldn't provide feedback the child could use to advance learning, which is our ultimate goal every time. So emphasize the validity as much as you can. And then a reminder about common formative assessments. Common 
Yes, it can mean the common instrument you design together in a PLC, a professional learning community. We're all gonna give this test, but the root of common assessment is diagnostic. It's meant to help inform the child, the teacher, everything, not final judgment evaluative. So we need to go back to those roots as we can and then realize common, and you can still protect standardization protocols, really refers to what evidence have we vetted with each other, teacher to teacher, that whatever class we're teaching, the evidence of this proficiency will be consistent among all the teachers. It's not, did we all agree, kind of in a compliance focus, on the vehicle, the format, and everybody has to give the same format. No. So when I say a common assessment, I mean, I'm holding you accountable for the same evidence. And you know what? One test I create, well, I might need to break that up into two or three different products for this child to express all the evidence that would have been expressed on the one test. And I do that because I'm out for evidence. I don't care if you take a quiz. I don't care if you take a test or write a paper or do the project or do the performance. That's irrelevant. What I'm looking at is whether or not you demonstrated evidence of this thing. And if there's an alternative pathway, who cares? Quite a few of those could be more meaningful to the student. And that's really, really cool because if it's more meaningful, they carry it forward longer. And the testimony for a teacher is what the kids carry forward, not what they once learned and then forgot promptly right away. Oh, so that gets into, excuse me, what about those alternative assessments? Well, here's what one student says. They're just as legitimate. As long as you ask the kids for the same evidence as you see there, and what's even better, they can often be more meaningful and we remember it longer. So this student's kind of encouragement to us, give it a try. Ask students to submit to you a proposal about how they want to demonstrate evidence. It might blow your mind in some really cool ways on how that happens. It's, it's very powerful and very moving what they come up with. So toward that end, let's just think about that and we'll see a, a video clip. And then about um, you know three or four minutes after the hour, we'll take a five minute stretch break. Here's an assignment that you're sitting around as teachers looking at it. Can they draw conclusions? You know, uh, can they use excerpts from the book to support a claim? Can they punctuate it? What are we all about? Hiroki Sugihara writes, it is a story that proves one person can make a difference. This quote means Sugihara helped the refugees even though it put him and his family in danger. On page 171, it says, if he put, helped these people, would he put her family in danger? And it goes on from there. What can we conclude? Well, we have to talk to each other, go, well, what evidence are we seeking for this kind of writing? And now where is it in there? And how many times do they have to show it before we claim that they can do it? Well, looking at this, you might wanna consider, what if they have a different medium? These students are into crochet and stitch work and all kinds of wonderful arts. Maybe it's mixing music, they're gamers, or they're just really into chess, or they're into baking. I wonder if they could take this science idea, this math idea, this analysis of a literary device and put it in those contexts and it's far more meaningful to them we would still rally around the same evidence. It wasn't about, did you take the test? It was what evidence did you demonstrate on that test? Oh man, that opens things up. So here's me 26 years ago. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Wow, he did not age well. I know, but in my own class, a student came up to me. I've taught five different subjects, but this was a middle school English class and I was teaching writer's voice. And the student came up to me and said, I don't want to take your test on writer's voice. I want to find writer's voice in music. And I knew he played the cello. So it was going to be classical music, I told him, and it couldn't have lyrics. And he said, how do I find it if there are no words? And I said, that's up to you. But I'm going to hold you accountable for proving and showing this and this and this and this. Do you still want to do it? And he was stubborn just enough. He did it. He chose Barber's Adagio. The theme to Platoon, if you ever saw that movie, it's been used other ones in other movies, but it's really hauntingly beautiful. I highly recommend it. Well, back in the day, we had audio cassettes. So now I'm gonna show you a little clip from my classroom from Jesse, who chose Barbara's Adagio to express writer's voice. And you tell me, does he seem to get writer's voice? It, it's, remember, it's just an excerpt. I think he does. And you, sh you should know this, Jesse went on to become a seventh grade life science teacher in New York City. So think about that. We're watching Jesse here in the moment. You will always have that guiding curriculum. You always have your eyes on the prize. It's like you have the compass. 
but the kids can help you create the roadmap by which you get there. And we get a chance to see what you have learned, to express your mastery of writer's voice, and each of you has chosen a different... Just so you know, there are 36 kids in the class, one Asperger's, one Tourette's, a number of children with learning disabilities, a whole bunch that are English language learners, some Caucasian, some not Caucasian. Don't judge that by the color of the skin. A couple gifted, and this one category called, category called regular education. I really don't know what that is. Different way, way to do that. Some of you working in groups and some individually. Today, in today's lesson, we started the sharing of the students' we'll culminating activities. Class with the remainder of the groups. Right now, For their culminating products, students wrote a narrative or expository and essay and, and were given a choice among six projects to student. demonstrate their understanding okay. of writer's voice. Jesse, I wonder if you'd begin with your Barbara's adagio. Uh, you have your piece, I have your tape, and let's begin. Okay. Barbara's adagio has an extremely strong and outstanding voice. This piece is even more mournful than the theme from Schindler's List. The first phrase introduces the theme of the piece and the tone, a sad, lost, and lonely voice full of hopelessness. The second phrase is a variation of the theme. Basically, it's saying the same thing with different notes, like a writer might say one thing in two different ways by using different word choice. This section gives a brief glimmer of hope, but not enough to keep the notes from sliding back into their grief-stricken melody. When Jesse shared his background on uh, the Barber's Adagio, I was so impressed with his choice of words. What, what a powerhouse. And he told me he had a thesaurus nearby and he, that he understood the words that he was using. Then in a surge of emotion with the realization that hope is never lost while there is life, the music breaks into a roaring fortissimo, shedding its coat of anguish and it shout, I am alive and there is hope. Louder and louder, the cry reaches the soul in four, four blazing notes. Notes blazing with faith, throwing sparks of confidence. Then, as with a pause at, in writing at the climax, there is silence. Silence that is deafening as the notes before it. Silence that gives you a chance to start breathing again. A chance to snap back to reality. A chance to contemplate what you have just heard. Truly, the si silence is as prominent as the rest of the piece. It was a good moment. I mean, I felt stirred. And, you know, you, sometimes you get goosebumps when things like that happen. But for now, I'll just live in wonderment of the Adagio's voice. Your reactions. So we'll stop it there. So I felt like he hit all of the marks. And if you see the whole essay, he really did. When students do this, they have to submit their proposal about a week ahead of time. Because I'm not going to have it on the day of the test when they didn't study. And they go, oh, yeah. I'm doing like a hip hop thing with Hamilton, but it's with math. Yeah, yeah, we're still in production and editing. Can I give it to you on Monday after the weekend? No, 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 no. You'll take the test, mister, and we'll just use it as a diagnostic tool, but we will see where you are right now. And then we'll see maybe about Monday. So they do have to do it and they do have to storyboard it out or outline it out. And what am I gonna say every time? Prove to me that your alternative way will show the same evidence. I have never in my career had to tone it up, you know, make it more demanding and full of higher expectations because their eyes are bigger than their stomachs. I've always had to tone it down. They're like, I'm gonna interview the mayor of our town and then I'm gonna do a, a, a survey monkey of 200 respondents and I'm gonna graph the results and then I'm gonna do a web, journalistic website dedicated. Dude, I was just gonna ask you eight questions on Friday. I don't care, this is like so cool. So remind them there's other things they do they only have to show the evidence and they can show it these really creative ways and many of the students by choosing these other routes have actually found careers seriously they've gone into that field or it's become a passion or a hobby a vocation it's really a very powerful experience not limiting kids to our sorry imagination their goal is that they will surpass us not be limited by us that's a huge different lens through which to see things so how am I getting out of your way and not limiting you to what I know? There are many, many times teachers teach to what they know and then they stop and it's time for the test. No, if you're worth your salt, the students surpass you in science. They write a better paragraph than you could ever dream of writing at their age or even today. That's the goal. Not that you're the oracle. Drink thirstily from my faucet. It shall prepare you for all that is to come. No.
It's a launching pad for your own achieving escape velocity, not being caught in this echo chamber right here. So lots of ideas. We have one more you video coming up talking about this, but it's so powerful. And I want to give you a little stretch break. I don't want to limit it. So I'm just going to talk, open this slide here, talking about student agency. And now we're at four minutes and 59 seconds and counting for your bio break. I'll stay here and answer questions if anybody has them. We'll see you in about four minutes and 50 seconds now. Thanks. And I shall have the food of champions. If you're not back, please raise your hand. Okay, good. So you must be back just fine. So now this is the second and the final video of our time together. And uh, what I want to do is set this up. This is a college kid, but I have done this with elementary, middle, and high school. Yeah, and college students. Uh, pretty much close to this exact quality as we do that. And the idea is that I want to get out of their way and decide, is there a time to not limit our students to our imaginations? So I want you to imagine, this is called the internet. It's available on YouTube. If you want to type in the internet and David Bowden, let me just put that up there. Um, you can totally get it on YouTube or you can go to this website here. But, and it's, it's appropriate for family values, don't worry, it's, it's appropriate there. But the idea is, this was made in 2014. Let me just repeat that on your screen, 2014. And it's amazingly prescient for what we're experiencing today. But how might we facilitate this intersection of culture and subject confidence, creativity, voice, art, metaphor, and what we're doing? What are we missing by using only a traditional assessment as opposed to opening the world to alternative assessment? So encouragement all around as you watch this and hope that we don't lose it. Let's take a look at the internet with David Bowden. Woven into each and every one of us, there is an inner net. We connect to each other, thread to thread, cell to cell, heart to heart. When formed correctly, the net forms community and we catch boatloads of life. We all yearn to be hewn in this collection, for it is the human connection. It's the reason why we have eyes, tongues, and lips, so we can be intertwined together as we see, speak, and kiss. It's the reason why we have right and left hands, so when my right reaches your left, pinkies, rings, middles, pointers, and thumbs interconnect in the loom of the human thread. But we have become disconnected by nations and nationalities, language and legalities, wars and quarantines, prejudices and bigotry. The net of humanity has been severed severely as we cut ourselves off in the pursuit of individuality. And in the midst of this shrinking world sensation, many are placing the blame on technology. As we burrow into our browsers, unplug by plugging in for hours, miss blue skies while working in the cloud, laugh out loud without laughing out loud. Humanity seems to be disconnecting at the one point in history when it is the most connected. But just as to the good, we are not entirely compliant nor entirely resistant. Neither is this tool entirely consistent. For the problems of our world used to be too big and too distant to connect to and know of its widespread existence. But now our world is too small and too close for us not to make a difference. We can now connect crowds around a cause, the ignorant to knowledge, the isolated to college, orphans to their fathers, donors to nonprofits, and injustices to those who can stop it. We can now see our newborn nephew, a revolution breakthrough, the troops as they withdrew, uncensored world news, and what is and is not true. We can now hear cries from Thailand, shouts from Somalia, and can shove our arms elbow deep through our screens, 
reach out and touch them, but so often we use this tool to ignore them and the rest of those humans. For just as fire can be used for warmth or destruction, we misuse URLs, firewalling off the world with distractions. We search daily but find nothing, add friends but lose community, look for love but get pornography, try to discover ourselves but lose our identity. And though this entity is filled with both healing and brokenness, guilt and innocence, some of what's godly and some of what's devilish, that does not detract from its significance. When it comes down to it, the true nature of this new age unit is in how we use it. Woven into each and every one of us, there is an inner net, and I pray we may stitch our world back together as we knit, patch, and connect. Yeah, it's poignant. Your students can do very clearly these, this level of work, but you have to be comfortable with agency, voice and choice. And when it comes to assessment, here are two slides, this one and the one that follows, of really cool ideas and how kids could own their learning. And it's a big part of assessment success. It's about self-efficacy seeing myself, and you don't have to worry about motivation nearly as much if the students have a voice and choice in their learning and assessment. Bounce your eye through this, and then I'll switch to the second slide. Yeah, Dipali, I would agree with you. And Wanda, thank you in the chat. And the second slide. Yeah, so this is possible. Assessment actually becomes a very exciting place. And remember, this assessment is an overt act of direct instruction. So they're not separable. You can't have good assessment and bad instruction and vice versa. So one gives oxygen to the other. One is the engine of the other as well. So don't be afraid to just weave an assessment as one of your instructional philosophies as you move forward. And it will fundamentally open doors. It will liberate you from that which would tether you to limited looking at that. Uh, school district I was working with a couple of months ago said, but Rick, there's only one or two ways you could assess something. And I said, wait a minute, that's just a problem of fluency. You haven't practiced this enough. So give me something out of the blue, any topic you want. And in one minute, I'll come up with eight or more reasonable assessments for it. And they said pronouns. Great. So here's what I typed in one minute or less. I'm a fast typer, right? Do most of those look fairly substantive and legitimate? John, I'm not really doing it right now. We don't have time for that. <laughs> but I would love to do dividing fractions. I could do that for you by email. And then if you look at it, I think most of those are legitimate. But then I said, I don't want this to be a flu because I was an English teacher, right? Give me something else. And they gave me computer coding. I haven't coded since Fortran, COBOL, and BASIC. But I try to keep up and listen to the conversations of the kids who are coding. So in one minute, this is what I brainstormed. I think most of them are fairly legitimate. Bounce your eye through that. Yeah, so what am I talking about here? I'm talking about sitting down with your subject like colleagues or even people who don't teach in the same subject and just building your fluency, practice brainstorming. I'm gonna do dividing fractions as John offered in the chat box. What are like 15 ways I could do that? Well, I know one that we could give them a problem and here's how five different classmates tried to solve it. Ah, which one did it correctly? How do you know which ones did it incorrectly and what would they need to relearn? Your critique of other people's stuff is actually expression of your own proficiency in that content. Ah, that's one of my test questions. So not can you do the stuff, but can you critique others? Got it. Well, this slide 
is a compilation of some of my favorite problems and questions across all five subjects I've taught in my career. And as I've coached other people, other subjects like the top one, one of these is impossible to answer figure out which one it is. Cause I can tell what you know, when you respond to impossible things, just as much as when you respond to possible things. I love that one. I do it a lot for every multiple choice. The second bullet, you have to do the next question. Why'd you make the choice you did? And you can't use process of elimination. Look to the left and down the last bullet. The question above was very complex, very deep. And then I introduced, Hey, if you change this one variable, would you change your answer to the question above? Why or why not? Oh, I can do that in an art class, a science class, a math class, English class, government, civics, social studies. It doesn't matter. But these are just really good, fun ones that are very constructive. And then a reminder of something. Assessment and learning is an act of creation. Can your kids create math? and science and law and art and physical well-being. That's the testimony for mastery. Not that they're a good parrot and they're good at echoing what the teacher said. Oh, look, he said what I said in my lecture. He must know it. No, they must take it and do something with it, create with it. That's what we're trying to get across. But many, many tests that I see are really just acts of consumption. The students come across as a consumer of knowledge just taking it in, spitting it out, moving on, I consumed it. Can you change your test questions so they actually have to create something? Sharon Bowman has said this exact quote, but I've heard of lots of other people, educators say it, take it to heart in your assessment design. Then realize that it's not an answer chase. A lot of assessments, they're, you're guilty of teaching to elicit a singular response. There's one right answer, you've got to get it. When really there could be complex multiple answers, so make your classroom and assessments much more of a, of a question journey, a journey of questions that, that lead to other questions and lead to still other questions. That's the gold as a teacher, not I have a finite thing to stack in my brain and for you to retrieve from my brain at, at an assigned date. It's a very different mindset. So the suggestion here is that you cultivate your own creative self. You pay attention to your intellect because it can atrophy when you've taught the same thing year after year after year. And we'll talk more about that in October. But then you spend time vetting the evidence, calibrating evidence with your subject like colleagues. What constitutes like developing versus truly excellent or mastery? Where's that line of demarcation? Let's talk. And then you brainstorm five or more ways to assess the exact same thing. And if you can't do it, go for big time. And then be open to the student proposal and really invite that into your classroom. Wow, does it open things up. Now the last little assessment type of assessment here, and then we'll do some principles and talk about how things uh, change with remote instruction and then we'll be done, is reassessment. So take a look, how'd you learn to play it? How'd you learn to build that instrument and to tune that instrument? It was through reiteration. That's how anybody becomes competent, is they do it over and over and they get critique and feedback in the interim in between and then they revise in light of that and they're a little bit better next time. Not one and done as preparatory for the larger world. So when you do relearning with reassessing, that is far more preparatory for what's to come post college or university or, or military or career training institute, whatever the directions are, but there are a lot of people who haven't been working in the, in the world outside of school. And they haven't been scientists or mathematicians or software engineers or accountants or architects or lawyers or police officers. No, they haven't. And so they just went to university and then the classroom and they say, I'm preparing you for the larger world. <clears throat> you don't get a redo. Yes, you do. How do airline pilots become airline pilots? They do their landings over and over and over and over again before they're real passengers. This is how anybody becomes competent. And secondary teachers who teach five periods a day, first time you teach a unit, guinea pig class, that first class. And then you get four redos the rest of the day. What to do, what not to do. Yes. So please be mindful. This is a part of cognitive science. And I'll put it to you another way. For you not to do redos, you are this close to educational malpractice. If you were to study how the brain best learns, you would never complain about doing redos again. You would try to find the logistic principles of pulling it off. So stop and consider that recovering from failure 
and the mistakes is the way you learn the most, not being labeled for it. And it's forever unrecoverable. Here's an F. That'll learn you. Here's a permanently unrecoverable zero. You should have used your time more wisely. Mm -hmm. Look at me. No, I'm wasting planet Earth's oxygen. It's a false assumption that Fs and zeros teach. They're terrible teachers. It's the recovery. I will jump in that pit with you and I will walk side by side with you as you recover from this mistake. I won't do the work for you, but I will walk with you and share the path that actually teaches kids executive function, respect for deadlines. But wagging your finger from afar and saying that'll learn you, go back to teacher school. And I'm really looking at schools of teacher education. They should have a whole course dedicated to how do you cultivate self-discipline, tenacity, motivation in students, adolescents, young adolescents, children, and so on. It's vital. Most teachers are worried about it as one of the most paramount things in our, our worry as we go into the classroom. What if they don't do stuff? What if they become really, really, you know, lethargic or ap at develop apathy? If you say this can't be redone, you said three things. It had no legitimate educational value. It was skippable. You've also said there are no consequences. The consequence for not doing your work is doing your work. I will haunt your nightmares. You will rue the day you didn't do the work for Mr. Wormley. But the most heinous thing is you're saying, yeah, it's okay if you don't learn this. That's the soft bigotry of low expectations. Don't go there. The, you're not going to remove the burden of their learning. And what we found is incompetence in something is never maturing or preparatory. So err on the side of competence as much as you can. Here's a teacher who outlines that, that it's always a regrettable thing when you deny the redo and it's far more preparatory. And you're listening to me and you're thinking, of course, of historical figures, uh, sports figures, uh, teachers, famous people who, who pushed out. If I had Tesla, this slide would be more uh, dramatic, dramatic, but I'll settle for Edison. And then you're thinking, but Rick, the kids won't learn responsibility. Um, I will go insane. And I'm saying, you can do it to maintain your sanity. And the kids will learn responsibility far better. And you're thinking, huh? Meow? Huh? And oh, I know. It's like a Looney Tune. It's incredibly weird. And that you would do it for full credit and that these things are all unethical like only giving half a point for going back and correcting something or the highest grade you can get is a 70 out of honoring the you're knowingly lying by the way and that's a moral outrage you shouldn't do that i have done all of those and they're all ineffective and don't teach kids responsibility so doug reeves had this idea that a d is a coward's f the kid failed you should have enough guts to tell him so when it comes to assessing things and the reiterative nature of learning, have two or three levels, four, three, two. And then one level, whether it's immoral reason or moral reason, this is called no evidence or not there yet, NTY. IP, in progress, uh, no evidence, whatever it might be. This, there is hope and we're there to engender hope, but to also do this, oh by golly, I will not cave into your immature self to dictate your destiny. I will get in your face and save you from yourself. So to, going back to this slide to wrap that, this segment up, let's not limit students to a uniform arbitrary, arbitrary timelines and embrace the idea that some kids might need to do it five times. If you need the logistics of how to pull this off so kids learn responsibility and they don't abuse you and they allow you to maintain your sanity, in chapter 16, which I will send you for free if you'd like, from Fair Isn't Always Equal, second edition, I explore how to do that. But you have so many great Canadians, Myron Dweck, Ken O'Connor, and Tom Shimmer, and Ann Davies in particular, who are proponents of this and would be glad to guide you right there in your own backyard. Rick, I'd just like to interrupt you for a second for, with a question from Brittany. She yep. teaches math intervention students, and she'd like to know how would you balance wanting to provide these high quality assessments to elicit higher order thinking skills and true evidence of learning with wanting the students to feel successful? And so, Brittany, if you want to unmute your mic, you could actually explain uh, your context a little bit more clearly. But she's wanting to know how do you cultivate motivation in those students to prevent and to prevent apathy. Brittany, is it okay if I talk, or did you want to elaborate? Um, you can go ahead and just ask questions as needed. I'm here. 
Okay. <laughs> uh, well, jump in any time. But one of the best things you can do is to disaggregate data. There is hope for kids like you're describing. So if I have, you know, five learning outcomes, I give a separate scoring or assessment feedback in each one. And those kids are given credit for the stuff they can do. I'm also going to be mindful that it's going to be three steps forward, two steps back for some kids. And a lot of students, especially ones who struggle academically, they can actually understand very advanced on grade level things, even though they don't have every tiny minutia inside that. So this might be a skill or a piece of content in isolation. And they don't get it right now. But we're going to do meaningful context. Well, all kinds of connections are going to be made. They'll have a bit more time to mature into this as well, get a bit more exposure to it in about four or five weeks. So I just let it go like Elsa, just let it go from Frozen. And then in four or five weeks, we revisit. And then we re kind of teach it again. We try to reassess and they go, oh, I get it right now. If we disaggregate, then they can see that they are successful. I can also make progress visible the small steps and the steps that they have to obtain are smaller. They're still leading to the whole, but you can have, and I'm going to talk about it here in the principles, you can have tiered assessments, a level two and a level one. The level two accounts for all of these, a level one accounts for a subset of these. And they do really, really well. We teach our heart out, they learn their heart out, and they demonstrate these three perhaps out of five. The other two, I will go back and, and teach them because they need a longer timeline, more support, and then I'll give them the test and the other two. They eventually achieve them. If I try to teach and assess all five, jamming it in a sense down their throat, they would not learn any of them. And my goal is that they actually learn all of them. It's just on a different timeline. You can start building that in and seeing a lot of the report cards, if you have to do that, as just progress status checks along the way. And then realize that the gray book is cumulative for the whole year. So they didn't get it in this one marking period, but they got it the next. It's irrelevant. I will be gently insubordinate with the school calendar, so to speak. And I will submit a grade change report form or we keep the historical record. Yeah, right here, you didn't know it. But the only time it really matters is the transcript at the end of the year. And even better because of COVID-19, more and more schools are doing digital and e-portfolios. So you have into the summer and even into the next school year, this portfolio will follow you and whatever age you are, you finally demonstrate this, we go back and record it and you get the full credit from it. So we can do a lot with the timelines as well and the disaggregation as a first step in, in creating this and then whatever we can do to make that progress really visible. Does that help? Yes, a lot, thank you so much. Okay, great, let me know if you have a specific scenario we can email or talk by phone. Okay, uh, I'm mindful of your time. We've got about 30 minutes left. I wanna show you some of these really cool other ideas. And these are the 14 operational tenants, the principles. The first slide in this segment is like five of them. We've already done this. So I'm gonna let you kind of bounce your eye through here. Who's, who's writing this stuff on my screen? Hey, who are you there? You think you're so smart. Well, let's just see how smart you are. Yeah, all right. Turn around and face the music. All right, let's take a look, read through them. They should all look familiar. Okay, so we've got the summation there of what we talked about just recently. So now a few more of these principles, starting now with number six. Assessment has to have integrity. So it accurately portrays. So any factor that we weave into it that would pollute the waters, that would distort the accuracy of the report, we stop doing. And anything that would clarify and make it more transparent, we do more of that. So we don't include in any assessment something that's not indicative of the very evidence we claim to be reporting. Well, what do you mean, Rick? I'm not a porpoise. I said that on purpose, of course. I'm too funny for this webinar. No, that's a dolphin. We can't conflate the report of one thing with something else. So if I'm reporting how nice you were, that's great. Or you had a nice, neat notebook, that's wonderful. But that's not a report of what you know about the parts of a plant. So I don't weave in the work habits in an assessment of a content thing. You can't weave in apples and oranges. They're two different things. I'm just saying. And we are about learning, reporting learning, not doing, or 
compliance, which is basically what you just emphasized. So the reportive evidence of the outcome or the standard is can't include any peripheral elements. That's what it says there in the corner. So let's be mindful of that. Oh, this is distorting truth. Sorry, we just got a really wicked lightning bolt outside my window. And now it's making the noise that comes with lightning. So what do all of these have in common? Bounce your eye through that. Yeah, you probably guessed it. They're all behaviors. And as this person would say, none of them are academic things. So none of those things can be woven in to the assessment report of the thing you're doing. And what we found is really interesting, when that has a separate column or addendum, like the work habits and the stuff you see here, kids care about it more. They actually mature in it. So it's actually very cool to separate that stuff out if you're really out for their maturity and the self-discipline in those areas. So what about group projects? Spencer, Clay, uh, uh, Spencer Kagan, uh, Robert Slavin, Johnson & Johnson. The biggest names in cooperative le learning and group projects are the first people to tell you, you never use a group project grade to assess any one child against any one learner outcome. You do a separate assessment after the fact to see if they pulled away individually from that. Ow! Oh, so a group project is just a teacher technique and I can't include teacher techniques in the grade. Absolutely. And in the assessment itself, if I want to be helpful. Seventh one here, time is not immutable. Time's a variable. I'm not going to hide behind a conveyor belt. This gentleman is a physics professor, did a really famous TED talk. I invite you to look at it. Just put the information in down below and you'll, you'll get it on YouTube. But he said at one point, what you see there to the left, take a moment and read the white font. Yeah, so we're not gonna be beholden to that. We're gonna say, okay, you learned earlier, great, we're gonna move on. Oh, you need more time? No problem. Your grade is just as legitimate down the road. And the thing we're mindful about is what the kids carry forward and can do independent of all assistance. That is a testimony for a grade and an assessment, but also for a teacher's effectiveness. Well, wow, what do you mean? Well, if you teach a child a certain type of writing, let's say it's a compare and contrast, and you spend several weeks building that, teaching them all the ins and outs, and they do draft, revise, draft, revise, all that stuff, and they turn in and get a grade, yay. But a month or three later, you'll do another one. Different raw data, but still a compare contrast, but you don't reteach anything. Because remember, it's what they can do independent of all prompting. They can go back and look at their notes. They can set up their own draft, revise cycle with friends, peer critiques, go for it, that's fine. They turn in the second one. That second one is more evidentiary of their true proficiency. So it should count more in the grade. It's a more accurate report because it's what you carry forward in this. Oh, not what you once did and then forgot months ago. Wow, that's gotta be a guiding principle. I can't do that with all my learner outcomes, all my standards, all my goals, but I can do it with the big boulders, the most leveraging of the things I teach in a year. I can repeatedly come back and reassess. Now, if they do poorly down the road, then we enter a re, into a relearning mode and then they can re, be assessed and accredited anew. Don't worry about that. The goal is they carry it forward when they're done with us at the end of the year. We're also gonna be criterion based, not norm referenced. So if I say, how is junior doing in your class? I don't want you to say he's above average, below average, because that's how he's doing in relation to classmates. That's norm referencing. We are, hey, can he titrate liquids? Does he understand how to capitalize proper nouns? Uh, the role of the mantissa in a logarithm, that kind of stuff is what we're really about. Uh, that's okay, no worries. I saw your little note there, Susan, in the chat box. So are you criteria reference? Are you evidence-driven in this? And then we're gonna be transparent. So any assessment that's kept in the dark is usually wrong, the wrong thing to do. So I'm suggesting, and I do this myself, and I coach teachers to do this, you give them the exact problems, the questions, whatever it is, the prompts, they're gonna get on the test in five weeks. Now, if they're just gonna memorize something, reserve the right to change the raw data, uh, change the denominators or the exponents. Maybe it's a cube root instead of a square root. But basically, it's the exact same question. So I might say, how did the premier handle the economy during that historical era of Alberta? And five weeks later, the question is, how did such and such premier handle the economy during this historical era of Alberta? Whoa, it's the same thing you said on day one. I know. So give out the question the vision of what they have to create 
on day one. Rick Stiggins is very fond of saying that and spot on. I've seen that quote probably in 30 books on assessment because it's so powerful. Students can hit targets they can see and that stands still for them. It's huge. Now remember when you do, just handing out the questions doesn't change anything. You have to help the kids use it as a study guide. They have to actually monitor their progress towards a goal. And if you stop in the middle of the unit and go, hey, what we did today, that's a really good basis for answering number five. Take a few moments now, work with a partner and come up with a robust, thoughtful response to number five. You're not giving away the store. You're priming the brain for what to ele elevate as salient and they will carry it forward longer. And your testimony is what they carry forward, not what you presented. Nobody cares what you teach. Teach whatever you darn well want. I'm not being flippant. It's what kids carry forward when they're done with you. Oh, that's a different filter through which I see all of my instructional design. And then another concern is that you do check your sense of fairness. What is your definition? Does it mean same? No, it means development of what they need. You need more days. You need more support. Go for it. Run, Barry, run if you're into the flash. Absolutely. But these folks don't need that. It doesn't delegitimize the later grade or the assessment report from it. Those dudes the upper left-hand corner had to research historic, uh, historical figures and then modern debate issues and then portray the historical figures as they would have debated those issues. That's Rosa Parks having words with Bob Dylan, in case you're wondering. And then they had to break character and explain from the research what they found that made them think that person would have responded that way. When I taught grade two, they would dress up as animals from the same ecosystem and argue from the animal's point of view on how to resolve a particular issue with that ecosystem. And we do a performance in the evening for the parents. But that's one of my high stakes final exams. The idea is I will do what's fair. I will not always do what's the same. And alternative assessments won't, aren't always this foo-foo fluff superficiality. They're often more demanding, but also, as we mentioned before, more meaningful. I'm also going to disaggregate. I'm going to separate this stuff out. Less curriculum per symbol. Look at all this stuff I taught in one quarter, one nine-week period. This is way too much. But the child's grade, B. That B means nothing. So Bob Marzano has this really cool thing called unity. Uni meaning one, dimension meaning domain. Look at each of these three students. The top first student does poorly in the first one, great in the second one. His score is 12. Student two does reverse, but her score is 12. Student three does mediocre on both. But his score is 12. By the sameness of my vocal inflection, I'm try, trying to prove a point. If all I write in the grade book or in the assessment report is the exact same thing, but if you disaggregate it, be totally different stories, ah, I wouldn't be remiss in how I responded. So I'm asking you, is your assessment revelatory? Reveal story, revelatory, like it says on this slide here. Oh, I thought I did, sorry. Is it revelatory? So here's an example of a language arts class, five different subjects. Here is the bar graph for student A. The average is 70. But student B, whoa, tells a totally different profile. I should respond differently. Student C this way, student D this way. But if you did the math, the average would all be 70. But 70 occludes the truth. So we disaggregate. So what does that mean? On our assessments, we actually write the learner outcomes on the quiz, the test, the paper, the project, whatever it is, the digital screen, whatever it is, and they actually get a separate report for each one. Susan, you popped up. Do we have a question? No? Okay. All right. Then the 12th one out of the 14 principles, it's got to be authentic to the learner's experience. A lot of times, for example, teacher will put, teachers will put novelty, curveball, really flexible thinking, divergent agility intellectually on their test. Let me see if they really know it. And they never did that on homework and classwork. That is inauthentic to the learner's experience. If you're going to put surprises, novelty on the test, by golly, there better be surprises on the homework, the classwork, and everything else. Otherwise, inauthentic. Here's another example. Science class. You do all these verification labs, recipe labs, predetermined uh, question, predetermined methodology to investigate, predetermined result. You get this result. I know you did the lab correctly. But what's the final test? An inquiry lab. You're testing different things. So take a close look. Is it in alignment with, with what the students actually experience? That make, increases authenticity. And then this idea that we do testing 
24 assessment 24 seven. We're like assessment junkies. So like baking bread, we're constantly looking, do I need more flour? As I'm kneading the bread, do I not need to do that? And then I cover it. Do I lift the cover, take a look? Oh, it needs more cover. I need to go longer with that or shorter. You know, the humidity in the air is really affecting it. So I'm gonna adjust things. We do assessment real time, formally and informally. Assessment is not saved for the end. So if I stop you in your hallway sometime, or I talk to you digitally, if we're doing it from uh, remote instruction online, I'm gonna say, how did assessment inform your decisions this week? That shouldn't be a scary thing. It should be very, very comfortable because you are vigilant and attentive assessing literally all the time. It's inescapable in a, a sound instructional design. And then the last of these principles is this idea of readiness we've already dis discussed. You can tier things into a level one, level two. Sometimes kids are like, I've been try going for level one, but I think I'm ready for level two. Could I try that? Yes. And if you don't get all of it, we'll just go back and reach it. We'll be fine. What if a kid has been taught at level two and he goes, I don't think I'm ready. Could I just do level one? You might say, let's do level two. And we'll just look at the places where you kind of you know, still need to develop because you do allow those redos and reassessments. So you don't want to think that this is watering it down. You're just re-chunking the pacing of it so the child can develop a, an independence. This is an art installation in Venice. Those are people there down at the bottom. I don't know if you can see that. It's a four-story building. Here's another angle on that. And I happened to be walking by and I decided I had a little bucket of paint. I was gonna paint an Italian villa in Venice. So take a look, I painted this on the wall. And the idea is that I give you lots of scaffolding, lots of template, and then I pull that away until you can fly solo. Oscar Wilde, the goal of any teacher is to put himself out of a job. So if you look at the paint uh, I put on the water now, and I need to kind of move this over so I can see, is I painted in the water that you're ceaselessly moving from dependence to independence. And if I asked you, show me how you do that, I would expect you could do that in your assessment design as well. Now, becoming evidentiary. We have just a, a few minutes here to take a look at this and some really good ideas about how does it go to remote instruction. But I want to tell you about a really exciting thing and this is a new website. And Susan Wu, do you want to take over just for a moment here? Um, well, you've got this and you've got the slide that follows right here. Oh, go ahead. Can you see my screen, Rick? I can. Yes, go for it. OK, perfect. Uh, so as many of you know, ERLC had just launched their uh, Essential Learning Outcomes a website to support all school jurisdictions across Alberta. And so what we did is in this project, uh, we basically brought together 39 curriculum experts from different school divisions across Alberta. And we put them into working groups for grades seven to nine. And we asked them to basically choose what would be the essential learning outcomes in each of the core subject areas from grades one to nine. However, we gave them three lenses to choose the essential learning outcomes. The first one being learning transfer, the second one being rigor and looking at the assessment piece, and uh, the third one is instructional scaffolding. So they use these three lenses and there's an instructional video on the homepage that explains the entire process that we used uh, to choose essential learning outcomes. There's also an instructional video from the teachers just reflecting on what it was like to go through the process. And the reason why we put this website together um, is um, multifold. So we all we know that um, teaching during the pandemic, um, school closure shutdown was very challenging. So we wanted to offer something that would um, provide uh, some guidance uh, for uh, informing planning for and of assessment and um, being able to do, to provide the essential learning outcomes. So as you can see, we've mapped out all the yellows. So when you click on one of these, we'll go to grade four social, you can actually see that the highlighted uh, pieces, the entire curriculum is mapped out for grade four social, but the ones they considered the essential learning outcomes are shown. And then we also have another section of I statements 
which is um, basically the curriculum, the ELOs, but in student-friendly language. So if we go back to grade four social studies, the I statements are mapped out in blue so that students uh, are able to um, paraphrase. So we have the um, curriculum being able to, to have it in language that students can understand. And then in the third section of process planning, in case uh, school divisions would like to walk through that process themselves under, again, the three lenses of transfer, rigor, and scaffolding. Susan, we, also, uh, we, have a, we have a question. Have they done it for French immersion curriculum too? Uh, no, we didn't have time to do it for French because um, we basically started this in the last two weeks of June. And obviously everyone was going on holidays after that. Um, so we tried to do what we could in that time frame, but um, obviously there are subject areas and grade levels that we haven't done, but we've captured, um, if you watch the instructional video on the first page, you actually can download the slide deck for how you would lead your learning teams through the process, exactly how we did, and you can, they're editable slides, so you can just make a copy of the slide deck and use it with your own learning team in order to replicate the process that we did. Great. And uh, so again, we have blank program of studies listed on here. Um, I believe we actually got the templates from Chinook's Edge, um, their website. Um, so if you want, you can email me and I can see if I can just send you the templates directly through email. But again, these ones are just blank. So you can use it to do your own planning. So that is another feature of our website. And as well, the last section would just be a section for professional learning. Um, so because we use the lens of rigor, of um, learning rigor, we actually um, connected them uh, because they do correlate with all of the sessions that Rick is doing this year. And we also have hyperlinked um, special different books. So if you click on one of these, it takes you right to the Goodreads preview of the additional professional readings. Sorry, my internet is uh, slow today, uh, but it just shows, it just tells you about what the book is so of our recommended readings. And likewise, if you um, click on one of the articles, it just highlights the article that will help you gain a better understanding um, of some of the content. Um, so for example, one of the things when we talk about rigor is depth of knowledge and how um, and, and what that means in regards to looking at the essential learning outcomes and ensuring that, uh, that um, the outcomes that you're picking is a wide range of the different DOKs. Okay, Rick, I will turn it back to you. Are there any questions? Not so far. Okay. I. Oh, you got, we do have one. Go ahead. Did somebody say say something. You'll have to unmute your mic to speak, so you can just hover over your microphone. Um, I was wondering what the color code was again. Yellow is those that are identified as essential. Yeah. Yes. And, and the blue is the I can statements. The I statements, yes. Okay. Cool. That okay. was awesome. I just discovered it yesterday um, while searching through the ERLC website, and that is amazing work. <laughs> Good. Right. And, it, and it's interesting, too, because multiple school jurisdictions worked on that for them to come to consensus on what the ELOs are. You can just imagine that there was quite a bit of rich discussion. And um, again, if you watch the half hour video, it kind of, we could just kind of walk through the process that you yourself can replicate with your school teams um, to do the exact same thing with your own curriculums if you don't live in Alberta. Yeah, or, absolutely. I think it's a good scaffolding for anybody, you know, all over the mm -hmm. world to take a look at it. And I did give you just a grade, grade nine social studies, just some of the examples there. I didn't do the yellow highlighting, but the idea that you would sit together and say, what is really truly evidentiary of this? And we need to enter into that because we're going to talk about evidence in December. I'm going to skip these slides, but they're here for you. If you want to chew on them, there's a lot of ideas here, including, the idea that you probably want to come up with a general idea of literacy or mastery for yourself, 
So what does it mean to be scientifically literate and mathematically literate and so on? And then you might want to consider your verbs to help you a little bit as you figure out, oh, argue against whatever it is, because that kind of brings a richness to the evidence and a clarity to it. And then you might want to consider uh, essential and enduring knowledge. And those large complex questions not easily answered. I gave some samples there to the left, one of which is from Jay McTie, who's been in Alberta many, many times, uh, and really a good uh, resource there. By the way, that happens to be my son, Ryan, uh, going into grade eight. And he's one of the few children whose parents gave us permission to use his photo. And then I get talked about know, understand, and do. But you've got a lot of evidence here from the Center for Media Literacy in New Mexico, some verbs to use and some really good ideas, but we are gonna revisit this on December 3rd. If anybody would like to come, here's how I increase it for tiering, but I, I'm very mindful that we have about seven minutes left and I wanna honor your time. So I'm gonna to come to the end of the evidence stuff, which is right after this. And then just a reminder, we did a webinar on how assessment and grading changes when you are doing remote instruction. And you can see that on the ERLC website. It's still posted, correct, Susan? You have to unmute uh, there. Yes, I believe um, they're, it's uh, in our YouTube channel. Okay, YouTube, you got it. So this is one of the slides that grading doesn't work for us. It's highly inequitable. So we want to de-emphasize the grading, but we want to emphasize the assessment. This is what we're talking about right now. All these things we've been talking about are so applicable. So the concern is one, how do we get instruction to children in creative ways, urban, rural, suburban, access to technology, no access, you know, whatever it is, all the, 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 the milieu of so many, the myriad of different situations. And so these are how schools in very creative ways around North America are doing that. This slide and the one that follows. And I would be glad to talk about any of these because I've been exploring this rather intensely with these uh, division superintendents, principals and teachers. So these are some creative ones thinking divergently and then slide two. If you have any you wanna to add to this list, let me know. But when we're talking about assessment, so I deliver instruction, so to speak, or the students are learning on their own with some kind of online tutorial, but then I need to get work back from them. Again, we do it through these two slides and then I have to give feedback to them. So I'll probably bring these slides back up again in December. But then a reminder that we have talked about earlier, so much of that was emergency teaching last year. And this year, we're kind of reinventing things and, and we're, we're gonna go slower through the curriculum. So many schools are saying, look, this year's stuff or last year's stuff, we will give you full credit whenever you master it. We know it might take longer time and more support because teachers also have different skill levels and readiness at online instruction if they're going to do that or if they're doing a hybrid there, version thereof or just dealing with the stresses that the pandemic in, uh, imposes upon us. So I get that. This is a reminder to be very patient and flexible and extend the window for assessment and learning. We gave these three warnings that it's not ultimate gradeability that determines your assessment. It's what is a legitimate evidence gathering thing that will create an accurate report. And then the idea that if it's gonna be final assessment, it probably should be asynchronous because not everybody's on the same emotional timeline, the same sleep timeline. They're dealing with the stresses. They may not want teachers or, colleague, or classmates to see in their homes. There's, there's trauma happening there. There's increased alcoholism and opioid use and anxiety and panic disorders happening. So you can do synchronous things for learning, maybe for building community, but assessment probably should be asynchronous. And then you're gonna have to be really cool with last year's curriculum, this year's curriculum, culling some of it. So what I did is I have this young lady giving you some advice some of which is new since the webinar I did before, and some of which is repeated. But the idea there's a mechanism to deviate from pacing guides and that you're gonna purge an overstuffed curriculum. Heidi Hayes Jacobs recommends four really cool C words. What are you gonna cut out? What are you gonna cut back? You're gonna truncate it down and make it shorter. What are you gonna consolidate? Oh, we can do this with that. And then what are you gonna create that's newly needed? But whatever it is, you kind of think, here are four to eight power learner outcomes. By golly, we'll hit these marks if nothing else. Here's secondary, they're important, but less so. And here's the third level, nice to know, but if we don't have time, don't sweat it. 
And then I'm going to ask you to get really intimate with last year's curriculum and next year's curriculum because we have to begin to see ourselves as actually operating in a multi-age classroom. And there are whole books and conferences just on that because students are going to be even more wildly diverse in their readiness levels. And you need to help kids make connections to what they know and also prepare for what's to come. You're so much more effective in the middle, right where you're teaching, when you are intimate with the level above and below. I mean, really, you make better decisions. You also have to be developmentally appropriate for the age level you teach. And then be comfortable with alternative assessments, make your assessments revelatory, do that student agency, and get up to speed in the multi-age classrooms. And then what I did from the spring webinar that you can see online, it's more fleshed out, is I took only assessment stuff, not the grading stuff. And I said, what is still viable in our remote instruction? So I've listed all these things. And after our time together in this session, you're going to recognize every one of these. You can still do formative versus summative. You can still brainstorm alternative ways and have kids analyze different levels of proficiency exemplars. You can get really cool ideas for teaching and for processing and for demonstrating mastery from universal design for learning. You can get, be aware that kids learn at different rates so you're not beholden to the same timeline. That assessment is about cultivating kids, not about sorting them. You're not gonna conflate the report of one thing with something else. You're gonna disaggregate as much as you can. And then you're gonna focus on what kids carry forward, not what they demonstrate and then forgot. How do you identify evidence of proficiency and really get that across? And seek more than one sample size. I mean, you need a larger sampling to create accuracy. Oh, so more than one incident of evidence gathering. I'm gonna get really into descriptive feedback. Again, we'll talk about that in December. I'm gonna be really good with reassessments. And then I'm gonna be so much more about what they know at the end of at the journey, not how they got there in terms of that final grade, but I'm gonna be really keyed in on the teaching student, teacher student dynamic, which is differentiated instruction to pull it off. Now, at the end of all this reminder of what you can still do, I did give you some really good technological resources. And then this is new as well, 75 different assessment apps where you can do assessment, but also get feedback for, from students. Some of them cost money, some of them don't. And I'm going to suggest, as I have done, you study five at a time and you invite students to study them with you, you know, a subset of that, and say, how would you feel if I did this? And you get intimate with it. Almost every week, I come across some new app in assessment, grading, and feedback that somebody's invented. And I went, oh my gosh, where have you been all my life? And so it's going to be hard to keep up. So if you can do like learn five every other month or maybe once a marking period, you're on pace. Now you have a Canadian hit parade of incredible resources that people all over the world reference right in your backyard. Every one of these is popular around the world. And if you haven't visited them, please do that. You've got this treasure trove, man. You don't need anybody from outside the province practically because you've got it all there. Well, across Canada, you've got it there in all other provinces. Man, I am envious that you have this. I wish I lived there so I could avail myself of it, but I do digitally long term. These are people on Twitter who will answer your questions and they provide research and practicality. Here are some other websites from other people with research and practicality outside of the, the Canadian focus there. And then these are some of my favorite current books on feedback, on assessment. There's the Moss and Brookhart book I was telling you about before. The, the instructional cha-chas is instructional stuff, but it's so entwined with assessment. Chunk and chew, you teach, and then you process. One of the best, most dynamic books, the instructional cha-chas. And then uh, Bill Farrader's wonderful book and how do you determine what is evidentiary in PLCs. What we've talked about today is from my book, Fair is a Noise Equal on the right. That's a shameless plug. On the left, we're gonna talk about summarization as assessment and processing later on. And then a reminder of what you, I asked you to do. As you're walking away from this, what were you reminded of and revalidated? What are a few new things you're interested in exploring deeper? And what do you really wonder about? And then you used to think what about assessment, but now what do you think? And that's probably the most transformative series of five or six of those that you do out of the four questions is really how you shift thinking in light of new perspective. So I'm hoping that you will join us 
for those next four out of the five part series all feed into the assessment idea and your success in the classroom. They're listed there for you. And that's how you get a hold of me after this. I turn it back over to Susan and your lives. Have a great meal, whatever you're going to have next. Thank you for your time. Great. Uh, thanks, Rick. Would you, on behalf of the RLC, uh, we would like to thank you for joining us uh, for the webinar today. Um, would you like to stick around for maybe five or 10 minutes just to answer? Because I believe that there probably are a few questions that sure. people weren't able to address. Uh, Kathleen, uh, you had asked a question earlier that we didn't get to. Would you mind unmuting your mic and you can just um, express your question directly if you're still here? Sure. Um, I guess my question really has to do with that idea of, of uh, the constant back and forth that you're talking about with students in terms of, oh, great, you've got these three out of the five concepts. You know, now we need to go back and we need to perfect those last two concepts. But I've got so much curriculum to cover that even though in theory, they've got till the end of the year to really show their understanding, which is why we end up doing cumulative grading um, in order to be able to adjust that. I don't have the luxury of spending three months on one concept for yeah, two students because I've got the rest of the kids to consider as well as the rest of the curriculum to consider. Yeah. Do you know you have that problem even if you didn't do anything I said today? <laughs> I mean, if you did a very traditional classroom, you always have that tension. Do I go on? Because this is, you know, this is just inane. This is like nice to know, but it's not really germane to what we're going to do. And this next thing is more fundamental and more important. Or is this so fundamental? I cannot go on until they understand it. Otherwise, what we're about to do will also be a mess. You've got those issues or they already have it. So no matter what you do, you have to get really good at those two subsets within the world of differentiation, scaffolding and tiering. How do I teach simultaneously multiple readiness levels in one class? And you can't do that with all your curriculum. It is physically impossible. So if you do it the majority of the time, by the way, that's 51% or more. If you do the majority of the time, you're normal. Sleep guilt-free at night. Do not sweat it. Because school conspires against teaching. I don't know if you're aware of that. We all kind of walk in and we negotiate with ourselves for what level of hypocrisy we will tolerate this day. And so what I'm gonna suggest you do is realize from Animal Farm, some learner outcomes, some standards are simply more equal than others, don't you know? Which is one of the themes from the book Animal Farm. And the idea is some of your learner outcomes are just way more pivotal. They're way more leveraging. And for those, I will go, no, I need to go back and revisit and revisit. Now, it might be I need to stop all forward motion and reteach right now, or I can do it later in a meaningful context, but I write a note to myself. So when I get to that particular unit, I go back and say, okay, Umber, Iqbal, Lakeisha, Miguel, and David, I need to go back and, and reteach because they didn't get that stuff before. But you have the same dilemma as a conscientious educator. What if kids don't understand something? Do I just say, oh, well, no, you would do whatever you would normally do. But I'm saying that if you have curriculum overload, which I agree, uh, in the United States and Canada, it is a, a huge amount. When I travel in a lot of countries in Europe and the Pacific Rim countries, I find they have a lot fewer standards, but they go more in depth and they give them more time. In fact, in PISA and Tim's analyses, you see that come up. It, for the United States, I don't know what it is for Canada, we tend to have 350% more science standards and 175% more math standards than Korea and Japan and Thailand do, but they do better on the scores, you know, on those international comparison studies. Like, ah, we're doing this mile wide, inch deep superficiality. So I get that it's a constant drain, but you have that issue no matter what. And if you had the skill set, the diversity of repertoire of all those really cool ideas on scaffolding and tiering, which we actually will revisit when we do differentiation later, you will have some way to kind of maintain your sanity there. But you also should do this, sit with your subject like colleagues and say, could we prioritize? We put our, you know, our adult pants on, we're, we're the big boys and big girls in the room. And we say, this one is just not as important as that. Because when you do remote or hybrid instruction or even slower in getting through the curriculum, you will have less curriculum you will get through, I guarantee it. 
It's a slower process than when you're meeting kids day to day. And now we want to try to guarantee they know it and go back and forth. It's going to take longer and you're going to have to really identify for these, we will fight for these. We will kind of let them go. Is anything I shared helpful at all? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, when you worded it that way, it, it doesn't feel that different than what I would do normally. I, I put it in the, in the chat for my kiddos who yeah. just aren't there yet. So we keep going and then I bring theme up again later and have to go backwards a little bit for those few kiddos that really didn't get it the first time or the eighth time and sort of do it again. But you only do that if it's really one of those powerful pivotal ones. Uh, you're exactly right. And then now it becomes a matter of record keeping. I've got the evidence and I'd have to be mindful. Oh yeah, they didn't have that. And then check this out. What if they had it, but surprise, you spot check like two months later and they don't know it. Now you enter into a, okay, do I reteach it because they need to know it by the end of the year and I need to carry it forward? Oh my. Now, how can I do this new unit where I do mini lessons and bring in previous curriculum as possible? And that's a management thing. I totally get that but you can't do with all of it. It's just, it, 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 the whole system is set up not to do it. So you almost have to break protocol in order to live up to its promise. Hey, we teach everyone, not just the easy ones. And that's where the ELO website also shares the process of how you can go about identifying what is considered to be um, essential. Yeah, that would really help. If I, if I have to bottom line it at a survival, that's going to be helpful that somebody's done that heavy lifting for me. Kathleen, I hope that helps. We can talk more by email um, if you like, because you have that in the handout. Anybody else have a, a clarifying question? And again, to remember to speak, you'll have to unmute your mic. Well, you could ask the question and we'll just do it telepathically. I can tesseract. I also have a TARDIS. So I'm bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. Okay, uh, so if no one has any further questions, uh, thank you again, uh, Rick. It's always been a, a pleasure listening and learning from you. And so thank you very much on behalf of URLC and ARPDC. We will be sending the recording link uh, shortly within the next day. Um, we did also have a request uh, for your chapter 16 of wow. Fair and Always Equal. So if you wouldn't mind sending me that link, I will I also forward it as well. I also noticed, Rick, um, in the presentation, there were some links that you put in your presentation, but we can't really grab them off the slide. Right. So if you wouldn't mind sending all of those in a list, I will forward those to participants as well. Oh, you mean as live links? Yes, so okay. because otherwise they have to look at your screen and type in each letter individually, right? That's what I want them to do. It's my evil plan. <laughs> right. <laughs> to create more anxiety. That's right. Okay. No, no, well, I would be glad to do that. Okay, that's great. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Take bye -bye. care. Bye. Have a good evening bye. or good afternoon whenever you're watching this. <laughs>